Welcome to Grab the MD. Be sure to subscribe, give a thumbs up, and spread the word. Alright, let's start off with the cardiac cycle, which is a series of continuous events happening when the heart chambers are being filled with blood and when the heart contracts. Understanding these events makes it easier to read a normal pressure volume loop and also the abnormal ones. So we have this simplified diagram of heart with atria on top, both the ventricles below, pulmonary artery in blue coming out of the right ventricle and aorta in red coming out of the left ventricle. The diagram is not anatomically accurate, but it's simple enough to make sense. The cardiac cycle begins with blood filling up the atria. All the incoming blood stretches both the atria outwards. The tricuspid and mitral valves, which were closed till now, they open under the weight of blood and the blood starts flowing into the ventricles. We will see what happens inside the ventricles in a minute. So after opening of these valves, blood starts leaving the atria, which means the atria can recoil back to their resting state. Some point along the way, the atria contract and push the remaining blood into the ventricles. This is called the atrial kick. Once that's done, the atria come back to their resting state and ready to be filled again. We saw how blood starts flowing into the ventricles as soon as the tricuspid and mitral valves open. This initial phase of ventricular filling is called the rapid filling and it's kind of a passive process because the atria have not contracted and provided the atrial kick yet. The blood pushed into the ventricles after the atrial kick is referred to as reduced filling. We can see the incoming blood is stretching out the ventricles just like atria. As soon as the ventricles are filled up to capacity, the tricuspid and mitral valves are closed. Right after, the ventricles start contracting but since all the valves are closed, blood is not leaving the ventricles, which means the volume inside is not changing. This phase of ventricular contraction is called the isovolumetric contraction. The ventricles keep contracting until they develop enough pressure inside to force open the pulmonic and the aortic valves. Opening of these two valves allows the ventricles to push blood out into the pulmonary artery and the aorta. This phase of ventricular contraction is called systolic ejection. When the ventricles are done pushing out blood, they go back to their resting state and the pulmonic and aortic valves are closed to prevent backflow of blood into the ventricles. This phase is called isovolumetric relaxation as the ventricles are relaxing but no blood is moving in because all the valves are closed. So there is no change in the volume inside, hence the term isovolumetric. Now that we understand the cardiac cycle, we can begin with a normal pressure volume loop, which is a graph that depicts the series of events occurring during a normal cardiac cycle, but in the left ventricle only. We can ignore the other chambers for now. The x axis is for left ventricular volume and the y-axis is for left ventricular pressure. If a line on the graph moves towards right along the x-axis, it means the volume of left ventricle is increasing. If the line moves left, the left ventricular volume is decreasing. Similarly, if a line on the graph moves upwards along the y-axis, it tells us the pressure inside left ventricle is increasing. If it moves down, we know the pressure is decreasing. Let's begin the cardiac cycle for left ventricle. It starts with opening of mitral valve, let's say at this point. As soon as the mitral valve opens, blood starts flowing into the left ventricle, which increases the volume inside the left ventricle. Initially, we get the passive rapid filling phase, and later, when the left atrium contracts, giving the atrial kick, we get the reduced filling phase. Notice how the graph is moving towards right on the x-axis. 
That's because we are filling and increasing the volume of left ventricle. After we are done filling, let's say to 140 ml, the mitral valve closes. After that, the ventricle starts contracting, but there is no change in volume because blood is not leaving the left ventricle yet since the aortic valve is still closed. So only the pressure inside the left ventricle is increasing and the graph moves straight up along the y-axis. This phase is called isovolumetric contraction. As we can see, there is no change in volume of the left ventricle because it's not pushing out any blood. After reaching a certain pressure, the aortic valve opens and the ventricle can push blood out into aorta. Blood leaving the left ventricle means the volume will start decreasing, so the graph moves towards left along the x-axis. This phase is called systolic ejection. Once the left ventricle is done contracting, the aortic valve closes to prevent backflow from aorta and the left ventricle relaxes back to its resting state. Since no blood is entering or leaving the ventricle during this phase, there is no change in volume and this phase is called isovolumetric relaxation. Only the pressure inside left ventricle decreases during this phase, that's why the graph moves straight down along the y-axis. Note how the volume inside left ventricle does not go all the way to zero when it's done contracting. That's because there's always some blood left behind. Let's say it's 50 ml. Since this is the amount of blood at the end of contraction or systole, we call it the end systolic volume. The pressure volume loop also tells us about the volume we put into the left ventricle up till the end of relaxation or diastole. It's called the end diastolic volume. In our case, it's 140 ml. Remember, end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume equals stroke volume. So we can determine stroke volume from these loops as well. In our example, it's 140 minus 50 or 90 ml. The entire width of this graph represents the stroke volume and in our graph, this should be equal to 90 ml. If we increase the length of this arrow, we increase the stroke volume. If we decrease the length, it means we are reducing the stroke volume. That's it for a normal pressure volume loop. It's time we see some conditions that affect the cardiac cycle and change the shape of the loop one way or another. Let's start off with aortic stenosis, where we have a stiff aortic valve that's very hard to open. The left ventricle has to work hard to push this valve open which means increased afterload for the left ventricle. So the ventricle spends most of its time in isovolumetric contraction phase to generate a higher enough pressure in order to open the stenosed aortic valve. Despite generating all this pressure, the left ventricle succeeds in opening the valve just a little and pushes out a very tiny amount of blood into the aorta before the valve closes again. Let's compare the pressure volume loop we get in aortic stenosis with the normal loop. We start with the left ventricle contracting to push open the stenosed aortic valve. To do that, the left ventricle generates a lot of pressure. That's why the height of isovolumetric contraction phase is more compared to that of a normal loop. This high pressure succeeds in opening the aortic valve. The ventricle pushes out a little blood. The aortic valve closes and the left ventricle relaxes back and gets ready to be filled again. Since the left ventricle is pushing out only a tiny amount of blood, we can see there's more blood left inside at the end of systole compared to normal, which means aortic stenosis results in a higher end systolic volume, which isn't a good thing because that means the stroke volume must have decreased. Check out the width of stroke volume here versus the normal loop. Notice how the end diastolic volume stays the same as that in a normal loop. That's because aortic stenosis does not change the end diastolic volume. It only increases the afterload, which results in a higher pressure, an increased end systolic volume, and a decreased 
stroke volume. Let's see what happens in aortic regurgitation or insufficiency. In aortic regurgitation, we get a loose aortic valve that can't close properly, so it can't prevent the backflow of blood from aorta to the left ventricle. The end result is left ventricle getting blurred from the left atrium as well as aorta when the ventricle is relaxing, meaning more than normal blood into the left ventricle during diastole, which increases the end diastolic volume. When it's time for contraction, the left ventricle has to generate a lesser amount of pressure compared to normal to open the aortic valve because the aortic valve is loose and already sort of half open. So the rest of contraction pressure is used to push out as much blood as possible into the aorta. Let's draw the loop now and see how it's different than the normal loop. Like we discussed earlier, blood pours in from the left atrium and aorta and fills up the left ventricle. This volume of blood is called the end diastolic volume and we can see it's higher compared to end diastolic volume of the normal loop. The left ventricle then contracts and opens the aortic valve at a much lower pressure compared to the normal loop. It then pushes out more blood into the aorta if we compare it with the normal cycle. The aortic valve closes and the left ventricle starts relaxing but remember there is a backflow of blood from the aorta so there's still more blood at the end of systole giving us increased end systolic volume compared to normal. All these changes result in a higher stroke volume compared to stroke volume we get normally. So we see how aortic regurgitation results in increased end diastolic volume and increased end systolic volume and a higher stroke volume all at a lower than normal ventricular pressure. What happens if we increase the preload or contractility? How would these two changes affect the normal pressure volume loops? We can increase preload by giving someone normal saline. This means there is now more blood in the body, so more blood will be coming back to the left ventricle and filling it up. That results in an increased end diastolic volume compared to normal. The left ventricle then contracts and opens the aortic valve, generating the same amount of pressure as generated in a normal loop. The left ventricle then pushes the blood into aorta and relaxes back to its resting state. Notice how the end systolic volume remains the same as normal. That's because the ventricle is pumping out all the extra blood it's receiving, leaving behind a normal amount of blood at the end of systole. But because the end diastolic volume has increased, we get a higher stroke volume as compared to what we get normally. What about contractility? We can increase contractility during exercise or by using catecholamines or digoxin in a normal person. Increased contractility means the left ventricle can pump stronger and push out more blood during systolic ejection phase when we compare it to the normal loop. The left ventricle then relaxes back to its resting state, filled again with blood during diastole, and ready to pump out blood once more. We can see that increasing contractility decreases the amount of blood left behind at the end of contraction, which means a decreased end systolic volume compared to normal. How does increased contractility affect the stroke volume? It increases the stroke volume because a strong beating ventricle pumps out more blood as compared to normal. This higher stroke volume is also the reason behind decreased and systolic volume. Notice there is no change in end diastolic volume and pressure during isovolumetric contraction when we compare these with end diastolic volume and pressure of the normal loop. So increasing the preload increases stroke volume by increasing the end diastolic volume 
and increasing contractility increases the stroke volume by decreasing the end systolic volume. Some questions might test you on a pressure volume loop by giving you only the filling curve of the graph and ask which way it moves in a certain condition. For example, they can mention restrictive cardiomyopathy and ask whether the curve will move up or down compared to normal. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, the hurt muscle becomes stiff, so it's difficult to fill it with normal pressure. We need a higher pressure to fill the left ventricle. So we say restrictive cardiomyopathy has high filling pressures. This shifts the curve up because this upward shifted curve depicts the high filling pressure of restrictive cardiomyopathy as compared to normal. The downward shifted curve here is for conditions that result in reduced filling pressure. Okay, that's it for this topic. I will see you in the next video, so be sure to subscribe to get notified in time. Have loads of fun till then.